So, what is a democracy? What makes a system democratic? Well, I guess one of the first answers you will give uh, me if I ask you that, I guess, is elections, right? Indeed, um, democracy the way we understand it today is not the one that the Greeks necessarily talked about. Although it has things in common, right, in the Greek, what Plato talked about, what Aristotle talked about was direct democracy, right? So direct, uh, direct democracy versus representative democracy. Direct democracy is when uh, citizens directly make policies, directly participate in government, individually, or as a group. Um, they all get together and vote, right? Is there direct uh, democracy around the world? Well, guess what? There is. Not at state level, but at regional level. Switzerland. In Switzerland, um, even at state level, uh, the citizens get to vote directly on, on uh, uh, various policies. There are regions where the actual government is all the citizens getting together into the public square and voting. So that's how they make laws in that specific, obviously, smaller, uh, smaller parts of Switzerland. So, yes, there is direct democracy today in the world, but not at, obviously, country-wide, because, why? Very simply, because today's modern state is not the same as the Greek city-state. That's why, because of all the differences we have mentioned. That that was a city, that was Ellensburg size, right? You could have direct democracy. Uh, modern state is something else, it's this huge beast. Leviathan. Um, so, direct democracy, we don't really have it, we have aspects of it. We have aspects of it. What are these aspects of uh, direct democracy? Well, one of them is um, referendum. So the referendum is one tool of direct democracy, right? What is referendum? Referendum is when uh, the citizenry of uh, is asked to vote, and uh, their decisions are binding, right? So there's a you know famous Proposition Eight or Proposition whatever. There were some on the ballot in Washington in the last elections as well. So everybody gets to have a say, so they get to legislate, basically. So referendum is when the entire population is asked, and they basically vote on an issue, and that issue becomes law. That's a referendum. The plebiscite, sometimes they, they're used uh, mistakenly. I mean, this is the sense in which I want you to use them. The plebiscite is the same thing, only that the decisions are not binding. The decisions are just consultative. They just, the population is just consulted, they do vote on specific policy items, a bill. A bill is proposed to the population, they, they vote on it and it becomes law, so the citizens act as legislators. Here, uh, plebiscite, um, it is not binding, so it's only a consultation of the population. So these are, they're um, typical ways of, you know, direct democracy. When we become legislators, that's direct democracy. Recall, recall votes are also another form of, well, exercising political, direct political power. And you know the famous case, uh, the governor before Schwarzenegger was recalled, the governor of California. A recall vote is when the population votes to remove an elected representative from his seat. Not all uh, levels of government, not everywhere, uh, does the citizens have this power, but it's a sort of direct democracy. And also then you have the actual direct democracy, right? In the Greek sense. Yeah? When the people get together and vote on laws, when you have the assembly of citizens getting together in the central square, raising their hands or whatever, saying I, and voting on legislation. And that again, as I said, happens. Uh, in Switzerland, for example, uh, the local, most villages actually, most uh, small towns are governed that way. There are, they have an executive, but the legislature is actually the people. So you have the actual direct uh, democracy uh, in terms of uh, public uh, gatherings, uh, popular, you know, popular democracy, popular gatherings. So these are forms of direct democracy, but none of them is dominant, right? In um, most of the democratic systems we know. Most of the democratic systems we know are representative democracies. 
which means that what? Which means that they're based on the representation of the citizenry, which means that people get to elect their representatives and it's the representatives who then exercise the function of uh, government, which is lawmaking and executing those laws and so on. So representative democracies. Well, what is then a democracy, right? First of all, then, people have elections. Well, elections, is it enough to, well, I, we go and vote. Obviously, this is not enough. Elections need to have certain characteristics for us to consider them truly represent, truly, uh, true elections, true mechanisms of democracy, true mechanisms of exercising uh, popular uh, will, right? So what? We call them, they need to be what? Free and fair. What do we understand by free and fair? Well, first of all, they need to be secret. So secret ballot is one thing. I'm going to list a few things, I'm not going to write down, but you should take notes. So the ballot should be secret, you know, in a, in a booth. No, you have to be free to elect whoever you want. If you're not, if it's not secret, you're probably not going to actually make your actual choice. And you're going to be afraid of what the neighbor says. Then they need to be universal suffrage universal suffrage I guess I need to write them now universal suffrage is basically uh, all citizens need to have the right to vote with obviously age differences and by the way uh, you know many countries uh, age, age uh, voting age starts at 16 um, universal suffrage and also in the US in certain local elections different candidates you need to have a choice. Well, guess what? That's not a given. So you have to have different candidates. Then you have these different candidates need to have different platforms. Meaning, not only do you have to, uh, you need different people to vote for, choose from, but also different ideas, different parties, different choices. Because if you have only Bill and Bob, but both Bill and Bob are from the same party, that's not different choices. Right? Different platforms. Um, then there needs to be a free, very important, free campaign. These people need to be able to spread their ideas, to ask for your vote, to debate, to propose their uh, different policies. Without that, all of this doesn't matter if you don't know who these people are. And then, very importantly, there needs to be a limited mandate. Limited mandate, both in terms of time, and in number. So elections, if you have all this and you elect one group of people, one party, but their term is not limited, you elected them for life, that's not democracy, is, there, is it? So their mandate needs to be limited in time. You don't elect them forever and in number because, you know, if you have this and you elect them for a limited time, but you they can be there forever and ever and ever and ever. It sort of goes against the principle of democracy. And you see how here how democracy has an underlying principle which we are not comfortable with, which is the fact that actually there is no, um, actually your party doesn't have all the answers. Actually your ideas are not the absolute, although they might be, I mean, philosophically they might be, but embedded in democracy is this sense which it might be wrong, by the way, I'm not saying it's right, but it's the sense that nobody has the, politically, in what regards how to man manage a society, nobody has the final solution. Nobody has the ultimate tools or means, and power corrupts, so you need to switch it. So this indeed is, as I said, alternation in power. So there needs to be an alternation in power, and in fact, one of the tests of new democracies is is there an alternation in power peaceful? Peacefully. Is there a peaceful alternation in power? Once there is a democracy in a country and they have an election and freely elected, do those people ever leave peacefully? And that's a test, because that means that these mechanisms work. Famously, right, one man, one vote. Right? That's the idea of free elections. But in Africa, when the, the countries, the states there became independent after colonialism, what you had usually was free election. One man, one vote, one time. Because they are acting one government and it never left. Took control of the state and 
and it never left. And that's what, what happened there. So it's not enough to have elections, you have to have free and fair elections, including all these things. But are elections sufficient? If you have elections, you have democracy, right? No. no. Look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, you can't uh, call them functioning de democracies. And they had elections, free and oh, it was all in the media, victory for freedom. Well, no. Because elections just brings different parties to power, but what if both parties are non-democratic? Right? So what else do we need? So what we, what we described here is electoral democracy. This is, this is what it's called an electoral democracy. This is, Iraq is an electoral democracy because it has free elections. Actually free. And that's about it. That's about it at this point. So that's an electoral democracy, it's not a full democracy. It's not what we, what um, if we will call from now on liberal democracy. Now liberal here again does not mean whatever it means in the US party system and whatever. We're talking about the science, we're talking uh, in, a, in a broader sense. Uh, liberal democracy. As political scientists and with a comparative view. Liberal democracy simply means that democracy, that model of democracy that was established in the 19th century with the advent of the modern state, with the idea of individual freedoms and rights and democracy and all these things that for you sound like, oh, well, that's normality and it's, well, no, as we discussed and we read all those philosophers and whatever, this is a recent development and is it the best? But this is the model, liberal democracy. So liberal democracy nowadays it's called, it's based on all these assumptions, so it has a few elements. One is free and fair elections. So you need to have an electoral democracy for, for to start with. But it's not enough. Another important thing is civil, so political and civil rights and liberties. This is why it's liberal democracy. Because it's based on this whole ideology, it is an ideology, that we talked about, liberalism, right? Of freedom, freedom of enterprise, freedom of free market, freedom, uh, social, uh, moral, whatever freedom, de de depends, right? But is, you, know, you have this idea behind it. But what this means more specifically is political freedoms are the freedom to be active politically. Is the freedom to speak, freedom to, to, to protest, freedom to assemble, freedom to have your party, freedom to be active as a citizen, freedom to be an active member of the polis. That's political. Civil rights are rights and liberties that belong to you as a citizen. Now this changes. There is no one set, right? There's no such thing as an absolute civil rights, right? And things are being included all the time or not, right? Um, there is no strict set, right? But there is an idea that all citizens should be equal, right? That's the essence of modern state. All the citizens should be equal in their rights versus and liberties versus the government, right? And there, uh, there's, you know, uh, the right um, to, uh, for example, the right to work, right? Not, uh, or rather, it's the freedom, freedom to work. Uh, freedom to marry. Um, I know that the, today there are all kinds of discussion about different types of marriage, whether there are one, but I'm referring to simply the freedom to, uh, for let's say a heterosexual marriage, that's not a given, right? The Jewish people could not marry whoever they wanted. In India, under the caste, the caste system, the different categories of population, don't just can, even if by law it's permitted socially, it's not allowed to marry the lower class. Literally not allowed. You can be stoned to death, right? So you know, freedom to marry, freedom to organize, freedom of the media, freedom of gathering, freedom of speech, right to vote, right to run for office, right to have to have a business, right to have an economic activity, right to work. You have the right to work. You don't have uh, nobody uh, has to give you work, maybe. Freedom to travel, freedom to move. In the Soviet Union, you couldn't just move through the country. You were stopped at each. Each, between each of the constitutive um, uh, republics of the Soviet Union. You couldn't move, you couldn't live wherever you wanted, within the Soviet Union. Um, so these array, array of rights, uh, civil rights, political rights and liberties, be able to
have a political activity, freely express yourself politically, and also be able to have the protections that are due to all citizens uh, that come from the proclamation of human rights, you know, this right to, to uh, free speech, right, so freedom of conscience, right, um, right to make a form of family, as I mentioned, in the traditional sense, it's, it's not a given, yeah, um, and so on. So, the protection of what we call, you know, human rights, but again, it's a very fuzzy concept, there are some strong, solid things, you know, right to speak, right to uh, you know, exercise of religion, and so on, but then there are fuzzy, fuzzy parts to it. So, however, a liberal democracy needs to have a system that protects these. You have to be free to speak, free to think, free to act within the limits of the law, right? So it's the state who gives you those freedoms. But that's added. You know, this is why you can have elections and even free and fair elections and alternation in power and you have not had these because, you know, let's say women are second class citizens or, um, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, you don't have actually a freedom of religion, you know, and so on. Now, actually nowadays there's also talk about social rights, but of course they're not a requirement of a democracy, but there, there is, uh, and by that, and we don't mean what is called here social values and other such things. Uh, social rights in the sense of um, uh, things that have to do with uh, your social, uh, uh, social socio-economic status. So there is a talk and, uh, about uh, the rights to education, a right to education, which means that you can demand it from someone, rights to medical care, rights to housing. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's, I'm telling you that this is part of the discussion, it's also uh, has been included partially to into some of the human rights documents in the European Union, so they, they become binding to a degree, uh, to those who sign up. So, civil rights and political liberties, political uh, um, uh, rights and civil liberties, rights of participation, of personal freedom, you know, uh, rights to, to live as a human being and also to live a normal life and also to be an active politically. These are needed. And then you have a third important part, which is rule of law. Now this is crucial. Um, test of a democracy. Rule of law is basically the idea that everybody, government and population, is equally bound by law. That this law is done according to certain rules that are democratic, and the law is democratic, and that this law is applied. So the rule of law is this idea of a universal framework of laws, that apply equally to everyone, that there is a functional, efficient judiciary to apply it independent from political actors, that everybody is subject to law equally, and that the law is not undemocratic. That's the idea of rule of law, and this is very hard to have, because you need a set of institutions that is able to function independently from, from politics, which means function independently from power. Well, how can you have a set of institutions that doesn't fall under the power of the government? in the modern state, right? It's very hard to have this action, rule of law. Uh, a functional system of law, yeah, it's very hard. And this is one thing that many countries that have these still struggle with, yeah? Um, I'm not saying independent judiciary, but to be able to function independently or autonomously. Okay, um, so rule of law is another thing um, some people also talk about this as a requirement to have civilian control of the army. That's as a requirement for democracy, learning from the experience of many countries which failed as a democracy because they, the military was too powerful. So civilian control of the army is another aspect. So what is then a liberal democracy? Um, a liberal democracy basically is this. You have free and fair elections, you have civil and political rights and, and, and liberties that are protected, you have rule of law, yeah? and um, overall you have a limited and accountable government. So these four, let's stick with these four for the definition of liberal democracy. Free and fair elections, rule of law, protection of uh, political and civil liberties, and Limited and accountable government. What does this mean? Limited and accountable government. It means that government is limited, means that it doesn't control all aspects of your life. 
You raise your eyebrows in surprise. Well, we'll talk about non-democratic systems. You'll see what we mean. So limited government that only governs certain aspects of your life doesn't rule every single aspect. You have a private sphere or a family sphere or a communal sphere that, where the government doesn't have a say. I wonder if in the modern state this is actually true. But we ex there is clearly a difference between when the government sets laws for everything and then it intrudes into every single aspect uh, of your existence, um, including you know how much you work out. Well, think China, actually. That was a practice. I really had to go out and work out. Um, and then accountable government means that the government can be held to account. Uh, that can happen through elections, that can happen through recall, that can happen through protests, you know, freedom to protest, uh, to letters, that there is a government that is responsive to the population and it's not overpowering. That's, these all are part of a liberal democracy. What we today consider a liberal democracy is this the best system? Does this mean that if you have all these, you're going on the right path? Is this the ideal system? Well, Winston Churchill has this, had this saying that the democracy is terrible, but it's the best system we've came up with. Well, that's up to you or me or, uh, to, to think about this and to also think of the critique of democracy that many have raised and, uh, you know, starting with Plato, although he talked about something else. So, um, let me end with the fact that uh, there is, what if a country has only parts of these? What if a country has only elections? We call it an electoral democracy. But what if the country only has elections and only some aspects of this, but not a real full-fledged set? Well, that's what we call illiberal democracy. Again, as many authors, you have many sort of uh, moment, uh, different concepts for all these realities, but this is one that has come up fairly recently. Illiberal democracy is basically you only have you know, partially political rights that have free and fair elections, you have partially rule of law, and partially accountable government. So, you know? so it's not quite a liberal democracy. It falls short from being a liberal democracy. It has trappings of it, but not all the trappings. Okay, so that's about what is a democracy. In the next lecture, we will talk about non-democratic forms, in the next lectures actually. So we'll define certain types of non-democratic regimes, and then we'll look at two case studies, China and Iran as two examples of non-democratic regimes. Thank you.